So today I'd uh, like to chat with you guys about a, a highly contentious issue, uh, and that's the use of our uh, the C-spine uh, in trauma. Um, no, we've got a diverse audience here, it sounds like, with uh, medics, first responders, some physicians, some nursing staff. Uh, and this topic, this general topic of spinal mobilization has recently gained significant attention uh, in kind of the EMS literature uh, as well as um, eMERGE literature over the past couple of years. Um, and although the policies surrounding backboard immobilization, significantly uh, AHS policies around backboard spinal mobilizations, have undergone drastic changes over the past few years, the application of rigid C-spine collars in awake and cooperative trauma patients still remains the standard of practice. The literature surrounding boarding of trauma patients appears to be dated, and we now know that it actually may be harmful to patients. Now, I rarely see in my job a patient who is awake and cooperative coming in from the field in with complete spinal precautions. From a wilderness perspective, I think this is a little bit different uh, because boarding patients often serves the purposes of extrication as well as to ease transport uh, rather than for pure immobilization. But that topic of boarding is a whole other can of worms. We can you know, have that discussion at a later, later date. So what I want to chat with you guys about um, is the concept of C-spine immobilization and awake and alert trauma patients with this bad boy right here. So the rigid C-collar that everybody is quite familiar with. So, and again, I just want to emphasize this, but please be clear that what I'm talking about is not C-spine immobilization in an unconscious patient or an, ad, an obtunded patient. All of this that we're gonna chat about is in the awake cooperative trauma patient. Um, so in prep for this talk, I looked at a whole bunch of literature. So primary literature and papers, reviews, blog posts, opinion pieces, social media, there's lots floating around out there right now about the application of C-collars. All that I could find was information on the non-utility of C-collars. So we're often told in medical school that half of what we learn is wrong, but surely this can't be applied to the C-collar. This is, you know, this is the foundation of trauma, essentially, and the absence of a C-collar results in an accusation that you intended to paralyze the patient. But when you look deeply, you'll actually find there's no evidence at all to support the utility or the benefit of C-collars in trauma patients. So the foundation of, of this talk here is going to be an examination of the dogma and to somewhat dismiss the dogma surrounding C-spine collars. And if you look at this dogma, it can be organized in sort of four main points. So the first point being that Un, uh, that stable patients, uh, awake and cooperative patients, have unstable C-spine fractures. So we'll sort of look at what is the incidence of unstable C-spine fractures in trauma patients. Number two, that additional movements of the C-spine will result in additional damage or secondary injury to the spine. Number three, that the application of this rigid C-collar actually immobilization and reduces movement in the C-spine. And then lastly, that spinal immobilization is a harmless procedure that can be applied to a broad patient population with limited consequences. So let's examine dogma point number one. So this is essentially looking at the incidence of C -spine, unstable C-spine uh, injuries and trauma. So firstly, there's no doubt that trauma can cause unstable C-spine injuries. We know that axial loads, severe flexion, severe extension injuries, as well as penetrating trauma, can result in devastating neurologic injuries in our patients. But data from worldwide trauma registries shows us that unstable C-spine injuries in alert, stable, and cooperative patients are actually extremely rare. So the first bit of data is from the UK. 
uh, and, and what this data suggests, it's, it's they found sort of per million people in the UK, there was an instance of about 10 to 15 cervical spine injuries in their general population. Now, if you boil this down, it's only over half of those ever actually had a radiologic injury or a neurological injury. So this works out to be at six to eight per million people in the UK. Data from a little bit closer to home uh, out of Ottawa back in sort of the, the mid 90s from Ian Steele, who's a huge you know, researcher uh, around um, EMS as well as sort of primary eMERGE literature. He found that in trauma patients, the incidence of a clinically important C-spine injury was about 1.7%. However, only 0.1% of those patients went on to have any sort of neurologic dysfunction in association with their C-spine injury. So I'm not saying that this doesn't happen, but I'm saying that it's very rare, and we've got good literature to back us up on that point. So tenant number two. Additional movements of the C-spine might result in additional damage to the spinal cord that's caused beyond the initial trauma, so this secondary injury that we all seem to be so concerned about. So it's, it's always been taught that additional movements of the C-spine in spinal patients is going to worsen that primary injury and you will cause this secondary injury. But in reality, there's actually been no data to support this at all. So I'm going to repeat this because this was huge for me. You know, there is no evidence to support the notion that immobilization provides any benefit to the patient. So to me, this was like a mind-blowing moment. The thing that I've been told since my first aid days, wilderness first responder, all this stuff dating back to when I was in high school, um, is there's no, there's no data, there's no evidence to support this. Um, now, I'm not saying that, you know, that grabbing a patient's head and moving around 45 degrees on their torso isn't going to cause a secondary injury, but awake cooperative patients, immobilization, it, it, it's not accomplishing what we, what we hope it would, or the evidence tells us that it's not accomplishing what we actually would. So I'm going to uh, spare you the long discussion um, about biomechanics, uh, but there was this amazing paper published by a New England, by an eMERGE doc in, in New England, um, where he was trying to change our paradigm as to how we think about this secondary damage to existing C-spine injuries. And his main point is that we need to be concerned with energy transmission and not necessarily motion. So his point is that it's the large and abrupt energy transmitted to the C-spine during the initial injury that causes the consequence in the neurological dysfunction. Um, the notion that these minuscule movements after that initial injury are going to cause de devastating uh, impacts to the patients is just simply unfounded. And he actually says it's an obtuse statement. So we've become overly obsessed with limiting all movements of the spine when in, fact, when in fact that damage is caused by energy. This is supported by all those stories you hear about patients who end up having unstable C-spines who you find them walking around at the scene of the injury. He knows, you know, he notes that there's no randomized evidence, there's no control trial looking at immobilization versus not immobilization to prove this point, but also comments that there's no evidence in the contrary. So furthermore, how many, how many of you have seen someone with an unstable C-spine injury? Put your hands up. Okay. So I'm just going to note that this is completely anecdotal. So I'm going to give you some, some anecdotes. Um, so please take this with a grain of salt. But I would say the vast majority, almost all patients that I have seen with an unstable C-spine injury have intense pain to their neck. They're truly in discomfort, and they actually won't move their necks. So it's the same thing, you know, with a big femur fracture, a big forearm fracture. Not a lot of these patients are, routine, are, are using that limb as they normally would without an injury. Broken bones hurt. <clears throat> so that's the anecdote and the anecdote there. So the natural, the natural response of the body to a serious injury is to provide somewhat of a de facto splint with contraction of muscles around the neck or around the broken bone. 
And that's going to limit additional C-spine motion. Um, so the, the, one of the few that I've seen in the field was a couple of years back driving um, back from Peter Lougheed and I came across uh, a car, um, a really small car, I think it was a Camry or some small Toyota uh, that had hit a moose. And there was a mid-twenties girl in the passenger seat who I approached the car, a window had been smashed, and she was sitting bolt upright in the seat. I asked her if she was okay. She looked at me and she said, I, can't, I, I, I won't, I can't move my neck. So, you know, I had her sit there, I examined her, and lo and behold, she had point tenderness C4, C5. I didn't have any gear with me at that point. It was my wife and I and our two kids. And um, so I stayed with her, EMS got there. They obviously collared her, put her on a board, brought her back to in the eMERGE, and lo and behold, she did have an unstable C-spine injury, but was okay from a neurologic perspective. So it just, it to me reinforced this point that, you know, people, people are going to use this sort of self-splinting technique and they are not going to move their neck if they do have a serious injury. Now granted, there's a lot of other anecdotal evidence that says, you know, people, is, you know, especially in kids too, walking around with minimal pain, you know, they have an MRI done a week later and lo and behold, they have an unstable C-spine injury. So that's, that's the contrary to that. But I would say on a whole, most people with broken bones, it hurts and they won't move their neck. So tenant number three to this dogma is that the application of rigid or semi-rigid collars are going to prevent additional movements of the C-spine. So to me, this was another mind-blowing discovery that when you look at this, there's actually no evidence that rigid C-collars restrict movement. So that terrible collar that we apply to people in efforts to restrict movement that theoretically prevents this patient from becoming paralyzed doesn't do what we actually think that it does. So as we just discussed, there's no evidence that additional simple movements of the C-spine cause additional damage, but even if that's assume, assumed to be true, to stop the C-spine from moving would require, would require the neck to be completely immobilized in all axes of movement. This is difficult because the movement of the C-spine is rather extensive and it's not just a simple flexion extension movements. Placing the patient in a simple C-spine collar isn't going to prevent all of these axes of movements. <clears throat> so the other thing you gotta remember is the neck is attached to the body. So even if the C-spine were firmly immobilized, any movements of the back or of the torso are gonna cause movement in that C-spine. So in other words, it's impossible to immobilize a C-spine without completely immobilizing your patient. So again, just like I'm saying, there, there is no evidence to support the notion that C-spines cause spinal immobilization. So even these halo frames used on neurosurgical wards after um, C-spine surgery, they still allow four degrees of motion. And these are devices with screws and into the skull, metal rods coming down to a supportive frame on your torso. So there's still four degrees of motion involved with this halo frame. Um, so another study uh, back in the late 90s looked at aspen collars, which are even you know, more supportive than the rigid C-spine collars that we use in the field. And they found again that they did not immobilize the spine. And the authors of this patient, the, of this paper, even remarked that cervical spine immobilization is a myth. So we can't actually accomplish what we want to do. Furthermore, <clears throat> if you look at movement of the upper C spine, so I'm talking C1 to C4, and these injuries are usually some of the most catastrophic injuries because of innervation of the diaphragm from these roots. If you look at this area, C1 to C4, and look what the rigid C collar does to this area, it's been noted in cadaveric studies um, as well as some imaging studies where patients get a CT angiogram of their neck with the rigid C spine collar that application of a rigid C-spine collar actually increases movement of C1 on C2. And they noted that about, there was about a seven millimeter increase in the distance between C1 and C2 with proper application of a rigid C-spine collar. Um, so in fact, 
rigid C collars may do the opposite of what they're intended with regards to immobilization of the spine. Kevin? You're killing me. You're killing me. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> so this next slide is just for Dr. Hanrahan. <laughs> Except, Kevin, it was a study in 2015. No. Well, I saw the pre-study. All right. Okay. Dr. Hanrahan stands corrected. Yeah, I know. It's hard. So this was, this was a super cool study. So what they did is they had an, uh, pardon? Yeah, 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 yeah. Even if it wasn't, I'd, I'd give you that one. <laughs> so this was a really cool study where they, sort of, they had a mock MVC set up and they had this, uh, this set up with motion cameras uh, basically surrounding the MVC. And then they tested uh, multiple ways of extrication. So one was a self-extrication, where these patients were allowed to get in on their own. The other was just cervical collar immobilization. And the last was basically a boarding procedure where you take the patients out. And lo and behold, the authors found that the least movement that occurred in the C-spine was patients who were self-extricating. And again, these are patients who do not have neck pain at this at this time. These are patients, they're not even patients, they're just study um, volunteers who are getting out of a car. Um, so this, this again reinforces the notion that in awake cooperative patients, they are going to do it best themselves. So if you look here, the self-extrication had a total, so this was the total degrees of motion over the entire extrication, so not a 13 degree movement compared to an 18 degree total movement with the application of a rigid C-spine collar. <clears throat> so, tenant number four, that spinal immobilization is a relatively harmless procedure and therefore can be applied to a large number of patients with a relatively low risk of harm. So it's been repeatedly argued that spinal immobilization is a relatively harmless procedure. And the perceived benefits certainly outweigh its perceived risks. Now, we've sort of shed light on its perceived benefits, and they don't appear to be there, but what are these risks? So it was often said, you know, back in, in a lot of the early EMS training, when in doubt, immobilize the spine. And much of this thought came out of EMS literature dating back to the 80s. So I read a few sort of blog posts and opinion pieces on that, and I didn't go through EMT training back in the 80s. Um, but essentially what people have said is, is back at that point in the States, the decision was made to simplify the EMT curriculum at that point so more people could obtain the training. And what was quoted is that it was much easier to teach EMTs to apply spinal mobilization rather than to teach a clinical rule or a selective mobilization protocol um, uh, at that point. Now that's obviously changing the literature and I know with, with AHS, with our policies, uh, there are selective immobilization protocols in place. So what it seemed like at that point is the indications in the pre-hospital setting for spinal mobilization simply became the presence of a patient. This blind emphasis on protocol without consideration of patient or injury type resulted in this current immobilization craze uh, that we're somewhat combating right now. And that patients suffering from any traumatic injury or any presumed neck trauma end up being immobilized before transported to the hospital. So initially the argument to immobilize just in case, it may have had some merit. Now, significant studies have shown that C-spine immobilization, and specifically the application of rigid C-spine collars, is a potentially dangerous practice. So the reasons that this may provide harm are multiple fold. So firstly, there's a considerable number of studies that are now examining 
airway considerations in C-spine immobilization practices. And what they're finding is that C-spine immobilization greatly interferes with airway management. So of the several studies I looked at, one of them examined mouth opening in patients with C-spine collar, and I think as we all know, it limits it. What they found is that mouth limiting was opened by 25% with the application of a rigid C-spine collar. There was some other EM, EMS literature that looked at what were the factors on scene um, that made airway more difficult and resulted in failed airways on scene. And the number one reason was impeded access to the neck and to the mouth based on the based on C collars. So interestingly, the reason that we're so worried about you know C collars during intubation is we don't want to cause a secondary injury and paralyze the patient while we while we uh, manipulate uh, their airway. However, there's actually never been a reported case of a secondary injury as a direct result of airway manipulation. Now again, this is gonna be a hard thing to prove, but looking through, you can't find uh, case examples of this. Um, but, you know, what we're starting to see based on some new emerging literature, that there definitely are failed airways that are a direct result of the application of a C-spine collar. Can I give you mortality or morbidity numbers associated with that? No, I can't. But I think just from clinical experience, all of us know that the airway becomes a much more difficult task with the application of the C-collar. So secondly, in addition to airway consequences, <coughs> C-collars actually increase intracranial pressures. So this, this can be uh, quite problematic in patients because most people, or a lot of people who have C-spine injuries also have concomitant head trauma. And these injuries can be very, very sensitive to small increases in intracranial pressures that can lead to devastating secondary outcomes. So the principle behind this is, is simple, that C collars are, are tight enough around the neck that they restrict venous outflow via the jugular system from the head. Now they're not tight enough to impede arterial flow and we still obviously want patients to be perfusing their brain. <clears throat> so the arterial flow continues to, f to flow into the cranial vault uh, while venous outflow is impeded. Since the, the vault is a closed space, this causes an increase in the intracranial pressure. And the amount of the increase varies depending on the type of collar patient position, but this phenomenon has been well documented. So lastly, C collars, they're extremely uncomfortable despite what Google would lead you to believe. So this is just a really small sample of the number of very highly attractive people with smiles on their faces with C collars that you can find online. But I think we all know what patients in C collars actually look like. So because of this discomfort, you know, a huge goal in the emergency department and trauma centers is to get the patients off a backboard and out of a C collar as fast as possible. So being placed on a hard backboard it also causes discomfort, but the C collar itself causes discomfort too. Even over a short period of time, patients who have spinal immobilization, they're actually going to develop pain and tenderness. When the patient is then you know, examined uh, by a physician at a hospital, this, you know, we're looking for midline tenderness. That is, that's, a, that's a huge factor that we're looking for. A lot of these patients may not have had spinal tenderness when they left the scene, but they sure do after being immobilized for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or however how long it takes them to get to the hospital. And most of us from a trauma setting, when we're looking at the decision to image a C-spine versus not image a C-spine, rely on a couple clinical decision rules. One would be nexus criteria, but most of us use the Canadian C-spine criteria um, for who and who does not need imaging. And a central tenant of both of these rules is the presence of midline tenderness in a patient. So often patients who didn't have that midline tenderness when they started now have it when they arrive at the emergency department. <clears throat> 
So they actually looked at, uh, there was a study looking at pediatric patients and the consequences of a mobilization versus not a mobilization, and they tried to sort of case control these studies the best that they could. And it was found that kids who were immobilized in the pre-hospital setting, they were more likely to be imaged because of this presence of, of midline tenderness. They were more likely to be admitted to the hospital. They were more likely to be admitted to the ICU. And they were actually found to have much more pain compared to their counterparts with similar injury patterns. So, this is a little bit of evidence to support the harm of C-spine collars, but we, we don't have, you know, we don't have this amazing randomized clinical control trial that tells us, yes, C-spine collars cause harm, no, they do not harm. However, there are certain populations where we do know that they cause harm. So penetrating trauma is one of those patient populations. Um, and I know the AHS policy surrounding application of, of C collars reflects this. And we should not be immobilizing patients with penetrating neck trauma. Um, there was a US study looking at trauma databases that found that there was a two times increase in mortality. I think it was an 8% mortality compared to a 4% mortality in penetrating neck trauma in patients who were immobilized. So patients with rigid C-spine collars in penetrating trauma do worse. So do not immobilize these patients. So there's, uh, there was this other study um, by a guy named Hoswald back in 1998, and he's really been sort of one of the key EMS and eMERGE physicians who is leading the charge against C-spine collars. And this is not a perfect study. It's been highly criticized. Uh, but what he did is he looked at the trauma registry in the States and he compared it to the trauma registry in Malaysia. Why he picked Malaysia and why they have policies that don't apply rigid C collars, I, I don't know. But they have much more lenient policies with regards to not putting rigid C collars on patients. So what they did is they looked at trauma registries over the course of a five-year period. They case controlled patients to an equivalent patient in Malaysia and they looked at their outcomes over time. And what they found was that patients who were immobilized ended up having worse neurologic outcomes than patients who were not immobilized. Again, there's been a lot of debate as to why this effect was seen, and you know, it's still not clear to this day exactly why it was done, but you know, the people who don't really feel that C-spine collars are applicable feel that it, it may be a direct result of the C-collar. But again, this is, this is still, you know, not perfect, not perfect sound evidence that we've got. So, what now? What do we do? So, although there is an overwhelming convincing evidence demonstrating harm, <coughs> um, we know that there is, there is harm out there associated with C, with, 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 with C colors. Um, but what do we do with all of this information? We have fears of worsening spinal injury, fears of missing a spinal injury, and fears of litigation that appear to be driving the process of C collars instead of scientific evidence. In the course of this, we made patients uncomfortable, we sometimes hurt them, and made their healthcare probably more complicated and a little bit more expensive. But despite the lack of evidence in favor of C callers, dogma in medicine is difficult, sometimes impossible to change. So cultural shift around C callers is going to be painfully slow and paradigm shift is gonna take even longer. And the movement away from C-spine callers, I don't think can happen in the field. As much as we want this to be sort of a grassroots effort uh, to abandon uh, abandon C-spine collars, I don't think it can happen that way. And as frustrating as it may be, it has to happen in a top-down fashion. So we need to discuss this as policymakers, as physicians, as medics, as surgeons, to form a unified front. From a personal perspective, if I came on shift tomorrow at the foothills, and I did not put a C-collar on one of my level one trauma patients, the trauma surgeons would have my head. So this, this is gonna take some time. So we need to be careful 
not to be cowboys. So I just want to be very clear as to what that I'm saying. We need to continue to immobilize patients with potential C-spine injuries. I'm just not convinced that a rigid C-collar is the best tool for this. I think from a backcountry and from a wilderness perspective, there are many immobilization techniques that can accomplish this, whether it's clothing or towel rolls or vacuum mattresses. They can easily accomplish this task for evacuation procedures. So, you know, this vacuum mattress, it's an excellent device uh, and probably provides the best stabilization out there. But do I think that we should pack C collars and first aid kits? No. Do I think that we should use SAM splints on C-spine as opposed to extremity fractures? No. Um, but I think we all understand that as soon as we get this patient out of the field, the first thing that EMS is going to ask us is, dude, where's the collar? So we just need to be very careful. So from an optics in a litigious perspective, <clears throat> C collars are here for a while and our protocols should continue to reflect the dogma despite the lack of evidence. So there are as many stories of worsening C-spine injuries despite immobilization as there are of positive outcomes in uncolored patients who are walking around with C-spine injury. The natural course of some C-spine injuries will be to worsen over the acute setting <coughs> regardless of immobilization techniques. We know that most of the neurologic deteriorations in spinal cord patients um, are the result of cord edema, decreased microcirculation, hypotension, and inflammation. But what we want to be sure is that you don't want this disease process to be blamed on a lack of immobilization in the field. So a shift away from C collars may be one of the largest paradigm changes in trauma practice in modern day emergency medicine. So we as first responders, EMS and emergency staff can't do this in isolation and it's gonna take some time.